I'm Gary Nickerson. And I'm Quinn Taggart. And this is Outside My Window. And our guest in this segment is Andre Haynes. In 1985, after attending Mount Allison University and Acadia University as a student of music and theater, Andre went to NYC and graduated from the American Musical and Dramatic Academy. On that experience, Andre says that his musical theater teacher was the first female conductor on Broadway. Andre spent many years performing, directing, and composing for stage, film, and television. He taught at Acadia University for four years and the Maritime Conservatory of Performing Arts, as well as running his own vocal studio. As time progressed, Andre developed a stronger leaning towards visual arts, and that grew into a parallel career and now focuses on all his artistic passions towards his paintings. Andre's works are included in both private and corporate collections around the world. In April of 2021, he was honored in the Nova Scotia Legislature for 30 years of contributing to the artistic life of this province. Andre is one of Canada's most prolific artists and has recently moved to St. John to continue his artistic journey. Andre just completed six months as the inaugural artist-in-residence for the St. John City Market and has just opened an art studio in the heart of the city's very vibrant art scene. Welcome, Andre. Good morning. How lovely to be with you. Well, that's quite a CV. Andre, I want to ask you, um, you know, going back many years, when do you recall first having a, an interest in, and in, uh, perhaps uh, that 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 budding talent for uh, for art? You know, I mean, I grew up with it, you know, dad working in the arts and my mother in, in music and directing and everything else. Um, but it began um, in the in the late 1960s um, with my uncle Jack, who um, was very influential in my life. And he was a famous Canadian playwright. He wrote Fortune in Men's Eyes. Um, about uh, being arrested as a homosexual in the late 1950s and thrown into jail. And he was an amazing, amazing man and uh, very, very inspirational because of his convictions in life and his love of art. So we would sit and watch ballet and opera together. And um, and so through the wonderful people around me and, uh, and my parents, um, that's where my early interest began. And that would have been around the age of five, I think. Now, with that in mind, what was your childhood like growing up in such a artistic family? Um, it, it was wonderful and bizarre at the same time. Um, when we were living in Toronto, uh, w- w- there were always parties, uh, New York cast people coming through, Toronto cast for this show or that. My parents were involved in the ballet school, um, you know, uh, uh, lots of opera singers and famous actors, and uh, even uh, Xavier Hollinger, the happy hooker, came to a party, as I recall. Wow, that must have been a thing. It was it was my dad's uh, PhD party, so it was a strange and uh, an eclectic bunch was always coming through the house. So what do you draw your inspirations from today? Like, I mean, with all the life experiences that you've had in the past and and, uh, family history and so on, where does your inspiration come from for today? I'm a daily painter. And so really, I paint whatever's going on in my life, whether it's an emotional subject or something that I'm tied into or uh, something that I see. I have an art cart. I wheel around. I paint what I see and where I go, the people I meet, uh, the experiences that I'm having. Um, Every day, my life is now absorbed in color and shapes and designs and and the world around me. It's very present-oriented. Now, I I noticed from your online posts that you're doing some uh, paintings uh, themed on your your Uncle Jack. So is this the first time that you've tapped into that? Yes, it is. And it's been a strange um, process. You know, as we get older, we re-examine ourselves and everything else. And I've been looking at my life and, and who were the major influences in my life. And, and so that's, uh, that's how this series of paintings uh, started to, to, uh, to come up. And where, where does it take you? Like, is there an end point in mind when you start a project like this? Or are you just going to keep going until you run out of ideas? Well, no, there, I guess there is no real end point to it. Um, it's, it's just trying to express where I am and who I am and, and, and what I'm thinking about. But 
but no, I, I don't set like I'm going to do 10 paintings of this series or whatever. It's, it's whatever is in my heart and my soul that I feel that I need to communicate that, that's worthy of being communicated. So of all the places that you've traveled, and you've gone to a lot of places, what are yeah. some of the most notable ones that, that pop out for you that gave you the most inspiration? Oh. Um, I didn't mean to ask a tough question. I know yeah, <laughs> it, is, it, it is a tough question because, um, you know, whether I'm traveling in the south of France or painting in Sicily or wherever I may go, uh, uh, Rome, uh, wherever, um, or just wheeling my cart around the corner and seeing a guy sleeping on a park bench. Um, my inspiration, I, I really can't say I have a favorite place. Yes, I love France. I love Sicily. I love parts of Mexico and, and different places. Um, uh, and I love my own backyard. Um, so it, it's hard to say. It, what it is, it, it's really taking time to stop and look. Uh, my father used to say to me, to be an artist, you had to have um, uh, tired eyes and sore feet. You, you've got to travel and look and look really deeply at what you're seeing. And, and I guess so I end up loving everywhere I am. Now, I also noticed from your, from your Facebook post that your, your, uh, your art cart has met a demise. Uh, have you, it did. Have, have you been able to replace it? No, the art cart has not been replaced yet. It broke in half at the bottom of King street with oh, all my okay. paintings and my paint supplies. Yes. And I had to lug the cart about 150 pounds up the street. Oh, no. So no, yeah, no, the art cart is, demise and and i actually saw it going in the garbage truck i was very sad oh, about that that is terrible yeah, but a new a new one will come a new one will come you you and that art cart's been through a lot we were i did over 400 paintings on that art cart in the past year wow and so i yeah i wheel up and around town and and um and and that really helped me uh, become known here in, in my new home of saint john as well i met so many people from so many different walks of life now, my memory of you from high school and then, of course, at the Yark doing a lot of theater and, and vocal productions, what, how, how has that transition happened over the course of time where you've gone from uh, theater, you've done some television, of course, and, and, uh, and the vocals into the art? Has it been a natural progression or has it always been like that? Have you done everything all at the same time? Oh, yes. I mean, you know, you go and you study different art forms and everything else. I started as an oboist, going to Mount Allison and music and, and then got more into theater and, you know, went to New York and got into theater and music. And uh, it, It's just an ongoing thing. You know, uh, my art has always been parallel in my career. But I found out when I was performing at Neptune um, that I didn't have the interest enough to be an interpreter anymore. I solely wanted to be a creator and not interpret other people's work. And so that is why I moved away from doing theater, um, especially performing and that kind of stuff in theater, um, and, and just really getting, getting into the art. So it's been my whole life. But Quinn, I mean, you, you know, I couldn't read or write until grade seven. Wow. I did not and, know that about you. Yeah. No, I couldn't read or write until grade seven. And dear Betty Bernard, uh, she spent every day with me after school um, trying to help me to learn to read or write. Um, and when the dyslexia did break, um, it was a blessing. Uh, I never finished all of my grade 10 credits. I did a couple of grade 11 credits, but I don't know if I even passed them. And then I went right to university, um, to play oboe. They accepted me on the spot at my audition, which I did early, um, on the provision that I, uh, finished my high school, um, which I never did. And I think, uh, most assuredly, I was the only uh, teacher at Acadia without a high school education. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Something to be said yeah. for real world experience, though. Yeah, you know, and anyone who's listening who's got a kid or who is a kid themselves and, and, and the education thing isn't making sense to them or they're not being able to read and you think they should be able to read, uh, just... Uh, be patient, wait, see how it clicks together for them because uh, dyslexic and other people like myself, we see, we hear, we feel, we think in very different ways and patterns. And when it does click in, it's, it's a beautiful, magical place um, that happens. And so anyone who's struggling with learning disabilities in their family or reading disabilities, um, hang in there, hang in there with those kids and, and, and keep helping them find themselves. Um, because it's not all about reading and writing, is it? 
you know, when, when I was going through high school, you're kind of oblivious a bit to other folks' situations and, and what they might be experiencing or, or going through. And you kind of focus heavily on what you're doing. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, there was a lot of pressure on myself in, in, my, in my family to go to university. And so I did. Yes. And that was a yeah. bust. I went one year and it was like, no, this, this is not for me. Not the and, best. And yeah. um, I went to NSC. Well, it was the vocational school at that point, but, um, and, and took computers. But the idea was, is I, I needed something practical rather than yeah. theoretical. I wasn't a good book learner. I was a hands-on kind of person and that's what's followed me through but I think I and I really believe that most of us are that way that we that we learn very well from doing and and not from sitting and regurgitating in your mind and in your own opinion what makes art art my father taught me that art means to join it that's the literal meaning of the word so as soon as you join people say oh I'm not an artist I can't draw I'm not an artist well Maybe you are an artist because maybe you put thing, two things together. You put maple syrup on your pancakes that that morning, or you, or you moved a bouquet of flowers in your house, or or you put a piece of uh, green clo- uh, scarf on your purple shirt, or or whatever it is. When you combine two things, you're making art. And I see so many people that I I meet who make art absolutely every single day and don't know they're doing it. So I'm I'm not I'm not judgmental about forms of art gotcha no it makes sense it makes sense and i mean mm-hmm. you know one person's vision of what art is doesn't mean that that's your vision and doesn't have to be and it shouldn't be no and it shouldn't be that's right everybody's art should be a unique and distinctive voice and and that's where the difference comes between arts and crafting uh crafting you may use some of your distinct voice um, uh, but you may be following a pattern or a, a laid out thing. Or when you move um, the crafts into art, like uh, many rug hookers do and quilt makers, they make up their own patterns and their own designs and their own color schemes. And, and then that becomes uh, an art form as opposed to a craft form, which is, is often you know, done uh, multiple, multiple, multiple times. Your art reflects your mood at the time, your feelings at the time, right? It does. It does, yeah. It's it's so important to do that. Um, uh, like, there's only one of each of us. And so even if I paint a bouquet of flowers or whatever it is, I want it to have my expression. I, I want it to be, to be my voice. And it's taken me 20 years or more now of painting to be able to accept the strokes I make, the way I make my marks, the, the colors I use. And once I accepted that, then I was able to find more joy and happiness in, in my painting. When you look back at at, uh, your previous artwork and you look at a painting maybe from a few years ago, does that bring thoughts back to you at the time? Oh, I was feeling this way this particular day or this happened that particular day. Does does that evoke? Yes. Every time time I see a painting uh, that I've done, uh, they come up in the memories and Facebook and stuff, and sometimes I post them. Um, it brings back that moment uh, just as vividly as, as any photograph or anything would. Um, uh, but it has a lot more that goes with it because uh, you're, you're standing there for a couple of hours painting or whatever, uh, and it's the smells and the sounds and the foghorns going and, you know, the lobster people unloading and the clanging of bells and, and whatever's going on. Uh, so it brings back a, an entire sensory feeling as well, uh, not, not just a cerebral memory, memory type of work. Andre, when I look at your paintings, and, and I'm always on your, your Facebook page, um, you know, and, I, and look at the characters that you paint, <clears throat> and I find myself, as I'm looking at those characters, imagining, well, who is this person? You know, what's that, what's oh, that person in, in, that, in that painting thinking? What's, what's going on there? That, that's really what, as you mentioned earlier, what, what art is all about. Mm-hmm. Oh, how lovely. You know, the, the other, uh, thank you for that, because the other aspect about art is effective communication. And when you're telling a story visually, it, like any uh, storytelling, uh, whether you're reporting, as you know, or uh, you're doing a fiction, um, uh, to 
make that storytelling uh, resonate with other people and be effective and communicate something is is a huge aim. And so I, I'm glad. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad that, that you ponder those things. When you're in front of the uh, when you're in front of the canvas, and you've got all these wonderful colors in front of you, and, and of course oh, you're yeah. talent, are you thinking? of what colors you want to use and how to incorporate them beforehand? Or is that, is that a, a, pro, a progressive process? Sometimes the color palette changes as I'm working, uh, depending on what's going on. Um, uh, look, the, the most incredible part of my life is I wake up every day and I get to stare at incredible colors. It changes the way my brain is wired, how I respond to things in life. Um, and, and, and so, yes, my paintings uh, are strong in color. I work the color uh, wheel uh, to get the most out of my colors and that kind of stuff. So I guess I do pre-plan a lot of my colors. Uh, the background might be the opposite of what I'm going to paint on top. So if I'm painting a green er, uh, grass and stuff, I might paint the under part a, a dark orangey or a burnt sienna color to give that earthy tone underneath. So... Uh, so, yes, yeah, sometimes I'm working forward, sometimes backwards, in and out of the painting. Um, it, it really just it just depends on, on the work. Um, often I like to take a white canvas, and, and uh, as so many painters do, and put a background on it. Uh, get rid of all that white. Put some yellow ochre on it. Put some orange on it. Cover up the whole thing, and, and then start painting your image on top. Um, uh, color is not only just uh, a beautiful thing and a thing of pleasure, but it also describes shapes and forms um, that simple lines won't do. Um, uh, so uh, I guess that maybe is too long of an answer, but uh, yes, color is so very important to me. Uh, it's it's never too long an answer when you're describing something like that. I think that it, you know our listeners are certainly enthralled in listening. Uh, to how your process is. And when you go back into the earlier days of, of when you picked up a brush and, and started to do art, other than maybe your dad and and, uh, and your uncle Jack, what were some of the other influences to your art at that point? Were there artists that, you know, you admired? Oh, of course. I mean, you know, moving to Yarmouth put us in touch with a whole lot of community of artists, you know, Lucy and Helen, um, who appear in my new book, um, Ruth Ryder, I mean, all the, the wonderful artists, uh, Hugh Eamon and uh, Brian Pl There were so many uh, wonderful artists in Yarmouth. Um, uh, so uh, all, all those peoples and their energies and everything else influenced me. And when I'm, when I'm in Cape Verde and out on the bar painting, I, I feel the strength of those people around me. Uh, who, who painted there for uh, generations before me, Mabel Day and all these people. Um, so yes, uh, uh, influence is, is wherever you see and wherever you find it. So I, I was highly influenced by Lucy and Helen's work, and um, uh, I'll, I'll never be a painter like either of them were. Um, but the influence of the love of color and the love of everything is, is still there. With each painting, I'm, uh, you know, I would presume that a piece of you goes with each painting. Are Are you worried that maybe the bucket gets empty? No, it, it's it's an amazing, wonderful world, and there's so much to see and so much to do. And and no, uh, with with every piece of art that I let go, my well fills up um, right to the top um, for the next one. And speaking of buckets. What's on your bucket list? You and I are roughly about the same age. I mean, yeah, I'm 59. Yeah. Are there are there things left for you to do that that you haven't got there yet? Hmm. I'm I'm sure there are. I have absolutely no idea because I don't know what's around the corner. Um, do I want to go on a balloon rider in a submarine or something like that? No, I don't really have anything like that. Skydiving's um, not I, on your I, list. No, no, I'm not <laughs> skydiving, I'm, I, and I'm not doing nude yoga either. Hot Ooh, nude yoga. Yeah, it's not that's happening. not happening for me either. <laughs> not on, no, not on my bucket list. Um, wonderful for those that do. However, uh, no, uh, look, it, it's tomorrow. Uh, what am I going to find tomorrow? What am I going to see tomorrow? What's the next painting? What's coming out tomorrow? And, and, you know, I'll do 400 paintings a year. Um, so I'm at it uh, all the time, every day, 14 hours a day, 
um, uh, creating and loving it. So my my bucket list is is really just just what's happening tomorrow. You know what's happening today. Um, what uh, what's taking my interest now? I, I guess that's my bucket list. And and not to jinx it, but I mean, if there was a point in your life where you couldn't paint for physical yeah. reason or whatever. What do you th- what do you see yourself doing? Have you pondered well, that's that? A terrible, that's a terrible question. I I, um, I, I understand. <laughs> I, I've I've pondered that myself because of, I mean certainly most of my work is cerebral. I have to think for a living. Yeah. If for whatever yeah. reason I, you know, lost my ability to do that, yeah, I, I I don't know what I would do. What would happen? Yeah. Well, I can an- I can only answer that in in the experience that I've seen and known. My dad lost his eyesight, uh, uh, macro degeneration, and this kind of thing, and his eyes drooped, and then he couldn't see where he was putting his pens, and he couldn't see the color anymore because of cataracts and different things. And um, and he still tried to draw, and he still tried to make his marks uh, as um, as simple as they were. And uh, right now I have a very, very good artist lady friend, Anne Aykroyd, um, who's also a well-known writer, and at 82 years old, or three years old, sorry, she's still creating art and sitting on the floor with mounds of uh, felts and papers and paintings that she's cut up and creating, and she can barely move her fingers, and I don't know that she can see all that well sometimes, and it doesn't matter because she still is doing the experience of touching and feeling and making. And so I think if you're a maker, hopefully you find a way to continue making. So if I lost the ability to paint, uh, I would hope that I would find the ability to continue to make. Yeah, that's the answer I was I was looking to get. Hmm. I, I, I don't think we make enough in society, Quinn. You know, we don't make our clothes, we don't make our mugs, our plates, our dishes. Uh, we make very, very little. Um. And, and to come across making and to become a maker um, gets under your skin and in your nails and in your blood and and you have to you have to make every day. So I, I don't think that will change for me. You know, and it's the same for I, I I I've been a creator, I guess if you want to put it that way, or a maker uh, in doing my uh, video work and and photography and other stuff over the years. And yeah. and you know what I had thoroughly enjoy being able to do my photography painting never really connected with me as far as that goes but you know when when I think of of what you do and and the process that you go through to get there it just seems like it's it's a lot more emotional it's a lot more um, connective than for me to just show up and take a snap well I um Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, but I, I would challenge you on that because I think that, uh, you know, the number one question is, uh, how long does it take you to do a painting? And and I'll start with, well, you know, 59 years, uh, two months, three days, and two and a half hours. There you go. Um, this, and the same is, is for you with, with your photography or other things you're doing. Uh, you're dealing with 59 years or whatever it is of looking and seeing and pointing through lenses and looking at lenses. Uh, so uh, you may have the ability to look and snap quickly and get a wonderful shot, whereas somebody without those years and years of seeing and experience and taking thousands of photos would not find that as easy. You know, and, and technology has kind of put a bit of a kibosh on, on some of the creativity that I do and that you don't need the eye anymore. You know, fix it. You know, if you yeah. take a shot and you want it a little more blue, then you add a little more blue. And so yeah. I, I challenge that you're not a photographer, you're more of a digital artist. Um, and, and, and not negating the talent that it takes to run Photoshop and, and, and make that happen, but you didn't capture it to start with. Therefore, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a fine line. Um, and so of course there's the memes that go around that, you know, Hey, you're not a photographer until you put it on M for manual you know, on your, on your camera. Right. But everybody with an iPhone can be a video producer. Anybody with an iPhone can be a photographer, quote unquote. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. And and, and I, and I think I, I, I say poo poo on anything like that. Yay. Anyone, any kid with an iPhone, any person with a, a, an iPad or whatever can take pictures and, and maybe they're not, you know, uh, photography greats. Maybe you're not photographing for the national art center today. Um, but maybe tomorrow you will be. 
And the more uh, tools that we can put in people's hands, you know, this is the great sadness of our school uh, system, is that we don't actually put enough things in kids' hands um, uh, to, to do um, the physical doing. And, and, and as you've done that all your life, of course, you just get better and better at it, don't you? Indeed. And, you know, and, and when you look at, at what's on the curriculum in the school system nowadays, it's a challenge yeah. in a lot of places to have music. Um, yeah. that's just, it's not there anymore. You know, geez, they no. took away cursive writing. It's like, holy crap. Right. Um, right. you know, at what point do you, you know, do you suck out all the fun of going to school? Uh, I mean, we had home ec, we had industrial arts, um, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff isn't uh, necessarily around anymore. Well, yes, we're, we're losing our hands on experiencing and we're, we're, we're trading it in for a fake life. If you had to give some advice to somebody, um, who, you know, maybe thought about picking up a brush and, and doing some art or, or, uh, uh, creating anything on their own based on your life experience, what would that advice be? Well, I've kind of said it already, and I tucked it in, and that is um, learn to love the lines you make. And I don't care if you're a dancer or a sculptor or you're, you're, you're doing photography or whatever. Uh, and what I mean by the lines, if you're a dancer, learn to love your arm movements and how your legs move. If you're a photographer, learn to love the camera and the shutters and whatever your uh, photographers are using in your darkroom and your equipment and, 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 and how you make things. Uh, because once you learn to accept the way you make things, uh, then it becomes an easier process to make. And it's not about cheaping out or, or finding the easy route because it takes a long time to, to be able to accept the way you make art. Um, but once you do, the world opens up in a very interesting place um, because you're a soul creator and, and a soul and unique voice. And that is worth more than trying to draw somebody else's emoji or um, uh, Japanese, I'm, I'm not sure what the word is, uh, anime? The characters. Anime, yes. Uh, so, you know, instead of copying that, come up with your own, do your own thing. Find how your pencil works or, or, or your dance or how you play the piano. You know, those, those, that's what makes it unique and interesting and and that's really at the crux of the art is is how is it unique how is it interesting how is it pertinent to the artist's life now social media is a bit of a double-edged sword and we use it in a variety mm -hmm. of different ways but do you mm -hmm. see social media as a plus or a minus when it comes to the art in general well um, of course, like you say, it's a double-edged sword. When I was studying in New York, um, one of my opera teachers uh, who taught people at the uh, Met um, was very convinced that microphones would not last in the theater, in the music theater. And so, and so we studied, uh, you know, projection quite a lot and that kind of thing. Um, uh, so, of course, they did stay and the technology continued and just got better. Um, it, we are in this technological advancement um, and and the technology needs to be there and needs to continue um, and, and needs to keep moving forward. Yeah, the, the evolution of, of tools and everything else, you know, um, you know, we can be sad that we, that we don't have, um, you know, uh, people at checkouts anymore and that we have to use our own self checkouts. Well, we don't have coal delivered either. So. Uh, there, there are advantages and disadvantages. The advantages, uh, the advantages of, of um, personal platforms and media for me are I can live anywhere in the world, post my paintings, and, and anybody can see them and, and purchase them. Um, of course, the disadvantages are, um, uh, for me, um, the anger, the amount of uh, spent grief on people we don't know, on problems that we can't fix, um, and, and those kind of things, but I couldn't live how I have lived and how I intend to live without, without social media platforms. Andre, you've enriched communities with your, your passion, compassion, and, and talent here in, in the Yarmouth area and the South Shore at Liverpool now in, in, uh, St. John, where you've really been welcomed with open arms, uh, indeed. So in each 
of these different communities. Is the visual arts community and the performing arts community unique to each one? Absolutely. Absolutely. Each each community and each arts community attracts certain types. And, and, um, and so although their Canada is still a small country um, artistically, um, and, you know, once you've worked around a while, you, you know many, many people in your field. Um, but each town has its own little unique dynamic. Each place I've worked has its own dynamic. And, and what the standard of art is, is, is also different in each place. Well, let's take a second and, and, and chat a little bit about uh, your your artist in residence at the St. John City Market. A, what does that mean? And and B, how exciting was that? Oh, it was absolutely thrilling. Well, I approached the city about uh, developing an artist in residency program for the St. John City Market. And what that does is it brings an artist into the setting, so in this case, the market. Um, where you create uh, live in front of people. Um, uh, and my work all uh, pretty much had to do with stuff going on in the market, whether it was paintings or assemblages or, 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 or the books that I've written. They all tied into being an artist in residence, of exploring the place you're at and trying to uh, leave something uh, new. Um, and creating something in that space. And my next artist in residency program happens next week. I'm very excited because I'm also the inaugural inaugural residence at the artist in residency program at the Stone Church here, which is uh, St. John's oldest church. So I'm very excited to find out what I'm going to find there as well. Uh, Yes, and so, uh, yeah, I had a great six months at the city market and met so many wonderful people and, and created hundreds of pieces of art. It was just terrific. And what do you take away from an experience like that? What what what's your what's your benefit out of that? Oh, a, a deeper sense of community, who the players are, who the people are, um, uh, uh, how people function. It was a new setting for me, being among uh, vendors like that, um, and uh, seeing the amount of work that they all have to do. Um, uh, you take away uh, friendships and uh, new companions, um, good and bad experiences. Uh, you, as an artist in residence, you have to be open to kind of what's coming your way. Um, yeah. You got to ring the bell? Interesting challenge. I did. I got to ring the market bell, which was hugely exciting. Uh, Maestro Fresh West got to ring it, I think, and um, Nelson Mandela's son, when he came, got to ring it, or, or nephew, and because um, George always rings it at 7.30 in the morning, um, but they let me ring the bell. Wow. I couldn't believe it. I know. It, it's I know. the little things. It's it, that people... I'm a four-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now if we only had the energy uh of a four-year-old it would be a lot and better. i do and i still do. you do yeah. yes yeah. i know yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned a couple of times about books so let's talk books um so while you're in saint john you wrote a book about a little mouse oh this is too fun it is so I'm sitting in the market as an artist in residence doing my thing, and I'm working away on a project, and a little mouse comes in and scurries across my space. And I said to myself, oh, that would make a lovely children's book. You know, like we do about a thousand things. We all say that sure. would make a lovely children's book. And so that day I thought, no, damn it, I am going to make a children's book. And so I began writing and drawing and coming up with this little very simple character, very simple illustrations about this little mouse in the market. Um, and then right away after that came the second book where the mouse goes around St. John. And um, the third book um, is uh, the mouse going around to the different communities here in New Brunswick. But that's not done because the fourth book in the series um, is actually about Yarmouth. And the mouse comes over on the Digby Ferry and meets his cousin um, at the Cape Fishu Lighthouse. And they go around, uh, around Yarmouth. Nice. I know. It's really, really cute. And the illustrations are adorable. So I'm, I've been getting a nice reception, and I'm so happy um, to have gotten the chance to do um, a Yarmouth book. Is this your first foray into literary arts? Yes, it is. I mean, can you imagine 
a, a, a boy that could not read or write, um, ever being able to write a book of any form. I mean, it's just, it, it's fantastic in itself. I mean, children's books for me are just, you know, one of those things that, you know, you, you pick them up for your granddaughter or for your niece or nephew or whichever, but, uh, you know, generally it, it, it's just a one-off, but you've got a great series started. Yeah, it's a lovely series, and I hope other communities will invite me to come and uh, and and have a uh, uh, visit them. And a uh, of course, in French means happy, and that's the name of our little mouth. So I've got a book launch coming up, eh? I'm pretty excited. Yes, I wanted you to chat about that. <laughs> yeah. So um, at Herbert and Bell's uh, Patty Durkee store um, out in Port Maitland, we've had a very long, long friendship and relationship. Uh, not only as an art collector, um, but as a friend. Anyway, she's going to be hosting uh, the inaugural launch on September 29th from 4 to 7 p.m. out at Herbert and Bell's, and we'll have some little nibblies, a lot of good conversation, and make some nice memories. And then on the next day, September 30th, from 2 to 4, um, I'll also be at Herbert and Bell's um, doing book signings. And hopefully you'll get a chance in between all of that to get out and do some painting. Well, you know what? You know I've got to, right? And Absolutely. so that's why the book launch. That's why the book launch isn't until four because I got to get out at the Yarmouth <laughs> Bar at the four to get start paid. You know the Yarmouth Bar has incredible light, and I've only seen it in a couple of places in the world now, and and I think it's because it's so surrounded by all that water and everything else in the southern location, and it's it's the light of southern France. It's the same kind of light, and um, and I dream about it. And, and and I see it in my life, so that's why I have to come, you know, at least twice a year. This will make a third or fourth time this year, but I, I have to come and paint there. It's one. When you say, where's one of your favorite places in the world? I don't know why I didn't say the Yarmouth Bar. It's a, a very special place. So, yes, yeah, so on the days of the book launch, I'll be out painting, and then uh, I'll come back and try to scrub the paint out of my nails and sign some books. It'll be a weekend of where's where's Andre today? That's right. <laughs> oh dear, <laughs> uh, it should be a lot of fun, and I'm so grateful to uh, to Patty Durkee uh, for hosting the event, and also for Rick Osmond, who is uh, a newcomer to Yarmouth. He is a summer resident there, and he has sponsored the book um, very graciously and generously sponsored the book. So I'm happy about that, and I look forward to being able to drop off copies around town too. Andre, do you ever think what the world would be like without artists? No. 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 Perish no, I, the I've, seen, I've seen, yes, no, I've seen the very first paved, uh, cave paintings and uh, cave par- uh, carvings in France and everything else. Um, there, there is no world um, without art. Uh, it, it's a necessity uh, to tell our stories, to tell what we see is a very basic human need. That's very profound, Andre. I want to ask you, if I may, I've always been curious. I mean, you're, you're a prolific, very successful artist. Uh, you sell a lot, of your, a, a lot of your work. And those works, as, as you said earlier, are, are part of you. And I've always wondered, how does an artist like yourself put a price on a, a piece of work? Oh, that's a very difficult question, you know, because everyone's got their own idea of what what their art might might be worth um for me i've been at it a very long time and i know what my work sells for um i know um uh how i have to move my work it's based on all kinds of things like i can't store 400 paintings at a time i i have to move them i have to sell them my prices are are reasonable um and and that's why they move Uh, also um uh, uh uh, I, I don't do galleries. Um, my prices would double or triple if I go into galleries. And so people want my work. They come to me. They find me on Facebook. They use the social media and this kind of thing. Um, anyone doing art who's wondering, how do I price this work? Um, uh, rent a table at a craft market. Um, put your price on it. See what people say. Uh, see if you sell some. If you don't sell anything, either your product's really bad or your price is too high. It's kind of like vegetables. If you've got Rotten Proteus, no one's going to pay premium price. Indeed, indeed. Mm -hmm. Uh, So again, uh, your book launch is coming up on the 29th and the 30th. Do you want to give the times again? Yes, I will. So um, it's at Herbert and Bell's, um, and I think the Yarmouth people would know that, that it's in Port Maitland. Uh, The September 29th is the official launch. It's from 4 to 7 p.m., 
please come out. We're going to have some fun. And then uh, on the next day, on the 30th, um, from 2 to 4, also at Herbert and Bell's, I'll be there signing books. Andre, it's such a delight to talk with you. We thank you so much and I look forward to seeing you when you uh, come down for the book launch. Well, my dear, dear old friends, thank you so much for this interview and, and having me on your podcast. And, and I think it's wonderful uh, what you've been doing for the past couple of years during COVID, uh, uh, keeping this community spirit alive and, and featuring uh, uh, so many interesting people on your show. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you very much, Andre. I'm Gary Nickerson. And I'm Quinn Taggart. And this has been Outside My Window.